You may think these three things have nothing to do with each other, but I'm going to show you that they have, are, and will be intimately connected with all of us. The universe is composed of galaxies. This is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope that shows 10,000 galaxies in an area of the sky less than 1 one-hundredth of the size of the full moon in the sky. Galaxies are composed of stars, billions, hundreds of billions of stars. This is a close-up of a region of the Milky Way galaxy, and you notice the stars are so close together they seem to touch. And in fact, that's the origin of the idea of the Milky Way stretching across the sky, that our eyes cannot see these stars as individuals, and so it looks just like a milky glow across the sky. Where do stars form? They form in giant clouds of gas and dust. And here's a constellation that last night driving home, I, was, I looked out the window of the car, and there it was. I wasn't driving. Uh, at me, and there it was up there in the sky. And you can see the four stars that make up the square or the rectangle of Orion, the three stars in the belt, and here is the Orion Nebula, which is a cauldron of star formation. As we close in, at the top are the three stars in the belt, and at the bottom you can see the nebula. And finally, here we have it close up. In here, we see hot, young stars forming. Gas, silu a gas that is mostly transparent and glowing, and dust that's silhouetted by the light coming from behind. And one thing that astronomers do is to analyze the light that we get from celestial objects, stars and gas clouds and galaxies. And in these nebulae that I'm talking about now, we can see many chemical elements, a whole host of elements. And that may not seem too surprising to you, but what if I tell you that when the universe began, it was chemically very simple. 75% hydrogen by mass, 25% helium. Chemistry was easy. You'd have an easy time getting into med school then, because everybody <laughs> would know chemistry. And nothing else. Fast forward 10 billion years, and here's the composition of the sun. Still overwhelmingly hydrogen and helium, but now contaminated with all these other elements that astronomers lump together to the dismay of chemists and call them metals. Everything that's not hydrogen and helium is a metal. Even more pointedly, here's the composition of us. Overwhelmingly not hydrogen and helium. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and a trace of these other things that you can read on your vitamin bottle. So the question is, where did these elements come from? What was going on in the 10 billion years between the Big Bang, the origin of the universe, and the formation of the sun and the solar system? And this is one of those questions that I can answer in one word, and that answer is stars. Stars, here's the sun, may look like serene and eternal orbs in the sky. But in their cores, they are seething cauldrons of hellish plasma at millions of degrees. And we have nuclear fusion going on, turning hydrogen, the primordial fuel, into heavier and heavier elements. And the elements that ultimately get formed depend upon how high the temperature is, which in turn depends upon how much material, how much mass there is in the star, how big it is. So let's look at stars of different mass ranges. Here we have the whole life cycle of a star. They're not really alive, but we anthropomorphize them. The life cycle of a star like the sun, where it forms in a cloud of gas and dust, and here's where the sun is now, and it'll go through some gyrations. But the important thing I want you to see is this part, because I study this part. Uh, planetary nebula, misnomer, don't worry about it. Um, outer layers of the star ejected and glowing. And the remnant of the star is a white dwarf star, very hot, very small, very dense. If one of those white dwarf stars happens to be in a binary system, meaning that it's paired gravitationally with another star, it can happen that that other star will lose some material that flies off into space and then is captured by the gravity of the white dwarf. And we don't understand gravity. Uh, John Lloyd was right. And we can get 
because the white dwarf star has a very, very strictly constrained upper mass limit, if you dump too much mass on it, it explodes. And that cataclysm is called a type 1A supernova. OK, hold that thought. If you have a star that is 10 times or more the mass of the sun, you can see it goes through more or less the same gyrations as the sun, but the end point is very different. This is a type 2 supernova. This is a cataclysm that can temporarily shine as brightly as a whole galaxy of hundreds of billions of stars. They're very bright. You can see them very far away. And what's left afterward of the original star is either a neutron star or a black hole. That's a, another TED Talk. What's the theme we've just been elucidating here? These stars explode, and they send material that was generated, that was made in their cores, out into space from which future generations can benefit. This is galactic recycling. Material gets expelled out into the interstellar medium from which later generations of stars are formed. For planetary nebulae, the elements that they enrich are carbon and nitrogen, very near and dear to us as organic beings. Type 1a supernovae are responsible for creating most of the iron in the universe. Think of that when you think about the blood flow. Type 2 supernovae, for the star before it explodes, it has turned hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon, carbon to oxygen, and gone all the way up the periodic table uh, all the way up to iron, which in fact gets destroyed in the core. But these elements are still present in the outer layers, and they get expelled. And the energy of the supernova itself is so copious, so incredibly intense, that even reactions that take a lot of energy to go make heavier elements from the lighter ones. And you get all the way up from iron up to uranium, the heaviest known naturally occurring element. Here's a periodic table, and I know it's very busy, but what I want you to concentrate on are the elements enclosed in yellow. Those are the most common elements in the human body. And what you can see is that every one of them, except for pre-existing hydrogen, which is kind of not fair because it was there at the beginning, but everything else required either a low-mass star, like the sun, pink, a high-mass star, blue, or a supernova to make. So we really are made of stars. The popularizer of astronomy, John Dobson, who died this week, has a great quote. If you give this cloud another 10 billion years, it will go to school and chew gum. <laughs> so if we shift gears a little bit, so we know how we make these elements, what do we do with them? What can we do with them, especially if we want to think about making a solar system like ours, a planet like ours, maybe set the stage for life that could ultimately be like ours? Where do we want to position these raw materials? So here is um, one thing that we need to know. We need to know that it can't happen too soon. If you make a star very soon after the Big Bang, then it won't have been enough time to get enriched. And so you won't have the whole vitamin bottle full of inventory of the heavier elements. So we've got to wait a little while. Here is an image of the Andromeda galaxy. This is a spiral galaxy near to the Milky Way, two and a half million light years. That's very close. It's a next door neighbor. Um, wouldn't want to borrow any sugar, but anyway. Um, so here is the Andromeda galaxy. And we can even think about where to put elements in a galaxy so that they will be properly positioned for a solar system like ours, perhaps, to form. We might think, since star formation happens most copiously where there's the most raw material, and that's near the center of a galaxy, maybe we should be looking near the center of a galaxy where there's all that stuff. But the answer is no, because when you have lots of star formation, you make lots of massive stars, you have a lot of supernovae. And supernovae, yes, we need them to make heavy elements, but they also make lots and lots of ultraviolet radiation and cosmic rays that would sterilize the life off any planet that dared to be nearby. So we don't want to be too close to the action. Then you say, OK, uh, how about if we go far out in the galaxy, far away from the action where it's going to be safe? Well, yes, but 
there hasn't been enough time for metals to build up out there, so you're not going to really do very well. And the combination of constraints like these mean that we can define something called the galactic habitable zone, the Goldilocks region, basically, where things are just right. So realtors will tell you location, location, location. I would say I would like to put another power of location there because you've got to be in the right place, but you've got to be at the right time. This is a graph of distance from the center of our galaxy and time before now. So this is galaxy formation. This is where we are now. So early on in the galaxy's history, you couldn't, you couldn't win. Too close, no good. Far away, not enough metals. But eventually, after several billion years of enrichment, then a little Goldilocks zone opened up that was just right. Far enough away from the action, enough of the heavy metals that we need to make a solar system. And in fact, this is where and when the sun formed. And that's why we're here. So the Milky Way habitable zone is roughly 13 to 30 or so thousand light years from the center. And the sun, as you can see, is comfortably within it. We can also think about extending this concept to distant galaxies. Now that we've got the telescopes and the methods to analyze metallicity in other galaxies, that means how much of the, of the heavy elements there are. And we'll go back to our old friend Andromeda, M31, and here's where the sun would be in Andromeda. The habitable zone is slightly farther out in between those orange ellipses, and we're sort of close to it if we were to put the sun there. So we can think about a habitable zone in Andromeda. Back to me. What do I do? I study planetary nebulae. These are the sloughed off outer layers, as I've told you, of stars like the sun. And how we study them uh, resembles a fluorescent light bulb. The central star in a planetary nebula, that's going to be a white dwarf, that's the core of what was a star like the sun. It's like a fluorescent light bulb in that it emits a lot of ultraviolet radiation. But when you look at a fluorescent light bulb, you don't see the ultraviolet, which is a good thing. The inside of the bulb is coated with a phosphor that takes that high energy ultraviolet light and converts it to visible light, which we can see. In this case, the role of the coating is played by the gas in the nebula, which absorbs ultraviolet light from the star and re-emits it as red and green and visible light that we can see. So if we take that light and pass it through a dispersing element, we get a spectrum. And because it's a hot gas, Kirchhoff's law tells us that we are going to get a series of particular colors. And you might think, well, OK, it's pretty, but what does it tell us? Well, astronomers know, and chemists know too, that different elements have their own fingerprints of the colors that they will emit. And we know what colors come from each different element. So for example, here's the fingerprint of hydrogen. Here's the fingerprint of oxygen. Here's the fingerprint of nitrogen. And if I see them all together, I can decode them. I can untangle them. And therefore, I can determine not just what elements are there, but how much of each element is there. So back to our friend Andromeda. Here I've got the galaxy. This is the outer edge of the habitable zone. And the map in the background is, the, uh, is a map of planetary nebulae in Andromeda, two and a half million light years away. We can identify 2,500 or more of these. And the ones that are labeled are ones that my colleagues and I have studied and are continuing to study. And we can find them out to 200,000 light years, very far beyond the bright central part of the galaxy. If you're going to study objects two and a half million light years away, you better have a big telescope. And my colleagues and I have been lucky enough to study uh, using the Gran Telescopio Canarias, which is one of the world's largest telescopes on uh, La Palma in the Canary Islands. So what have we found? Well, in our study of metallicity of these planetary nebulae far out from the center, we use oxygen as the proxy, because it's easy to study, and it's a good stand-in for all the metals. So what we find when we graph the abundance of oxygen versus distance from the center of Andromeda, we expect, because remember I told you that the amount of star formation goes down as you go away from the center, we expect this. But what we see, and we're continuing to study, and my student Kerry Hensley is doing a thesis with me this year, is studying uh, a bunch of planetaries that are even farther out. 
we have found that the fall off is not nearly as great as we predict. And the answer, the question we want to answer is why? One of the things that came to our attention recently is that there appears to be some kind of neutral hydrogen bridge, which I'll show you in a second, between M31 and another nearby galaxy. And that got us to thinking. Galaxies collide in space. Galaxy collisions are messy, energetic, chaotic, and great for star formation. Every blue splotch here is a cluster of hot, young stars that are being formed. And you can see great silhouetted clouds of dust and, and very energetic gas clouds. So galaxies colliding, we began to think, what if Andromeda collided with another galaxy years ago, years ago, billions of years ago, giga years ago, and some of the inner material that is more metal rich, as we expect, got splashed out to the outer reaches. And that's what's responsible for this high oxygen abundance near the end, uh, near the edges of the galaxy. So let me show you. Here is M31. Here is M33. This is a finding chart if you want to find it in the sky. And this smoking gun that I'm talking about, this neutral hydrogen bridge, here's another image. That's just a star in the way. It wouldn't move. And so this neutral hydrogen bridge, this is a, a contour plot of hydrogen between M31 and M33. Perhaps it's the remnant of an encounter, not a head-on antenna-like encounter, but more of a glancing blow three bil billion years ago that could have splashed these stars out. And this is a brief animation of what might have happened then. This is a, uh, from the pandas uh, collaboration, which is out of the University of California. So 3.4 billion years ago, M31 and M33 moved toward each other. And you see here, there, that glancing blow, M33 has these tidal tails pulled out, and the disk of Andromeda is now distorted. And this is where we think the stars could have been splashed out. And now M33 is headed back to M31. And in the future, uh, we'll probably hit it again. And if this is the case, then we may have an explanation for what we have seen in M31. But lest you think that we are far removed from this kind of intergalactic violence, I should tell you that M31, M33, and the Milky Way, as all as part of the local group, were moving under each other's gravity. And so, in fact, in about three billion years, we're going to be in the center of the action because M31 is headed right for us. Here it is in the sky today. There's the Milky Way that we see in the sky, our galactic disk. And Here's a simulation of what we think could happen. Looks like fun at first, but, <laughs> but this looks more and more like the antenna galaxies here. And as we see, as we move forward billions of years to 7 billion years, the two galaxies will have merged into a featureless giant elliptical in the sky. And there won't be any more Milky Way or Andromeda. It'll just be one. And there is a possibility that the sun itself would be flung far away from the center of either of these galaxies, perhaps off into intergalactic space. So what all this means, of what I've just told you, first of all, we're stardust. We need both high mass and low mass stars to make us. That we have to be in the right place at the right time. That collisions among galaxies, interactions may alter the classical notion of what's a habitable zone. And finally, in about three billion years, hold on to your hat. Thanks. <laughs>